My final game comes from the Spanish Team Championship in 2006. Playing white in this game is Gregorio Rodriguez Vera. And playing black in this game is our hero, Lucas Eduardo Mendoza Contreras. I'm only going to say that once because you certainly don't want to hear it more than once. And I certainly don't want to say it more than once. The difference here in White's approach is not earth-shattering. White plays perfectly reasonably in the opening, but I think by any normal standards, he's given up any right to advantage with the quiet Bishop E2. Essentially, White adopts a common-sense approach to Black's system. He says, well, OK, Black's system is perfectly reasonable. All I can do is get my pieces out and wait for something to turn up. Well, that's certainly what White does in this game, but whether something actually turns up or not is another question. In the end, the game is a draw, but as you'll see, Black was pressing for most of this game. And he starts the ball rolling with Bishop B4, which is as active a move Black can find in this particular position. Obviously, if you're feeling solid, you can play Bishop B7. You know, that is another approach. But Bishop B4 at least forces White to think about Bishop takes C3, whether Black plays it or not. You know, this structured damaging exchange is could be a source of concern for White. Anyway, Rodriguez Vera doesn't seem too bothered by that and sets up a threat of Bishop takes F5 after Bishop D3. And Black maintains the tension with Bishop G4, which I think is a good move. White shows his contempt for Bishop takes C3 by playing A3. And Black continues to keep the tension with Bishop A5. In general, if you're the stronger player in a game, keeping the tension is not at all a bad idea because it gives your opponent plenty of chance to go wrong. That's the basic idea, keeping the tension in the first place. You know, Black could take on C3. Again, that seems reasonable. Um, White recaptures, and uh, probably the most sensible move is to cast Bishop B6 and Rook E8. You know, White's got to think about his bishop, so he probably has to go a4. And then a sensible continuation for black is knight b6. Bishop drops away, knight d5. Let's say White pushes his pawn and then knight f4. This will be a typical move sequence. Uh, in this type of position, I think black is okay. I think White's got some, some weaknesses to nurse. He's still got the problem of pin to consider. The pawn on pin four looks weaker. All these factors in the position compensate black for the loss of the two bishops. So um, I imagine this position is fairly equal, but White has some immediate problems to solve. OK, that was another way Black decided to play Bishop A5 in the game. Bishop G5, Black castles, H3, Bishop H5, and now G4. I personally don't like this move. You know, once again, we see White when having to face this type of solidity, he's unable to decide exactly how to formulate his strategy. You know, he's veering between passivity and aggression in this game, it seems to me. The idea behind G4 is fairly obvious. <coughs> White wants to put that knight on E5 and try to tie Black up. But Black finds a very neat way of diffusing White's idea, a tactical way. He makes a move which looks impossible at first sight by taking on E5. But it's very clear in his mind that by damaging the pawns after bishop takes c3 and playing queen a5, he can cleverly outwit white. And the, the point of queen a5, first of all, it hits c3. Secondly, it pins that pawn on e5 to the bishop on g5. So a very clever play by black. And um, I think immediately black has a very reasonable game. Well, in the game, white went, white went bishop d2. I think if he takes on f6, he's got nothing after queen takes g5. And after f takes g7, I think the best move is rook fd8. Now there is pressure all over the place in white's position. Um, what I particularly like about the, the black position is the activity of the queen there. And, um, you know, there are various positions for the queen which look very threatening to white. White's got problems on the dark squares in this position as well, and difficulties with his pawn structure. So this is why white retreats with bishop b2 in the game, and now black also retreats with knight e7. c4 attacking the queen, queen c7, but you know only black can be better in a position like this. The bishop on d2 is not very impressive. It's going to spend a lot of time in this game looking at a white pawn on e5, which is not the ideal position for the bishop. And um, well, there's no doubt about it, black is 
slightly better here. Um, simply because White's pawns are so good. Alright, there's still a lot of play left though. Uh, it's not a lost position for White. White plays bishop b4. That shuts down the bishop with c5, bishop c3. Now we see a miserable play for a bishop really. Looking at a second pawn, this is what you don't want. Um, but still White's position has to be broken down. Rook a d8. Queen f3. Bishop takes d3. C takes d3. And now the reason back took on d3. Knight b8. He's thinking about perhaps targeting that pawn on d3. He's certainly thinking about occupying the d4 square at some point with his knight. And it's easy to see a path to d4 via c6. So counterplay is the order of the day for white. Rook a b1 hits b7, easily muted by knight c6. a4, and then black plays a5. Admittedly, I think that's a move I would probably have preferred not to have made. Um, I think personally, if I was back in this position, I would have settled for rook d7. And just to prove my position a little bit more before playing any sort of committal move like a5. Probably why I could force, um, force something by playing rook b5, b6, and now a5. But still, after rook a, rook f8, I, I have to say I prefer black in this position. It's hard to see a way through from white, and he's still got that problem with d3. But anyway, the guy goes a5. Fair enough. Um, he's clearly going to shut down shot after rook b5, b6, and then perhaps answer rook. E, B, 1 with knight B, 4. Okay, fair enough. White thinks, okay, I can cover that with queen E, 4. And after rook D, 7, rook E, B, 1. Black play rook B, 8. We'll see in a moment what intention White had after knight B, 4. But for the time being, White can do nothing. He's just marching to and fro with G, 2. A, 6, giving the black king a bit of air. King G, 1. White saying, well, okay, do something. I'm not going to do anything at all. I'm just waiting for you. So black moves in with knight b4. And now we reach the critical moment. What is white's idea against knight b4? I mean, if he does absolutely nothing, d3 is just going to drop off the ball. And the rook on b5 will be sidelined for the rest of the game. So white moves into action with d4. This was his clever idea. He's going to go a pawn down at this end gate. After c takes b4. Bishop takes b4. A takes. Rook takes b4. D3. I ask, well, how can Andrew say that he's going to fall down? I can just sense it. You know, White's, White's going to be completely tied down to the defence of that pawn, which is that happens in the game. Rook b3, uh, d2, rook d1, rook b d8. And now with White chronically passive, Black can go to work targeting the pawns there. We know that White has three weak pawns, and Black has only one weak pawn. It's arguable whether this pawn on d2 is weak or not. Certainly, it probably can probably be surrounded and won. But by that stage, Black is winning a lot of white sports on the, the queen side. And my feeling is, Black should probably win this position. He doesn't win, but um, I think that's a fault with his technique more than anything else, as we will see. Well, White's just continue, got, got to continue to play force moves. He's got to get rid of that ball on D2. That's public enemy number one. Black moves in for the time being with Queen C5. I think that's a good move. Rook b5, rook d4, another good move by black, queen e2, obviously if white takes on c5, black takes on uh, e4, now there are twin threats to the rook, and rook d1 check, so <coughs> really queen e2 is fought by white, and now we see black winning a pawn, this is how it all comes to pass, queen takes, rook takes, now black definitely has ideas of rook c1, which takes away the idea of rook b6 for the time being. So king f1, rook takes a4, rook takes b6, and hey presto, black has won a pawn, and should really go on to win. Um, I don't see any obstacles really in black's way, um, as long as he plays correctly. Rook a3, okay, black is still nursing this pawn advantage. Um, not sure about this idea of going in to h3 with the rook. Uh, it's tempting, but if we just go back to, to rook a3, uh, if we track one more move, 
I think possibly the most effective way that I could see is to play rookie four <coughs> and just keep the white king out of the action. Now white's got to play some sort of passive move like like rook b5 and black slowly improves his position to king h7. Just bring the king in and defer active operations for the time being. The trouble with rook h3 is that, you know, actually I think black misses the impact of, of, of one of white's upcoming moves. King g2 happens. Rook takes h4, king g3, g5, and now rook d6. Um, yeah, I think I think black missed the impact of this move. It's hard to imagine that you know black should still have any difficulties here. For instance, after rook d2, black's got to play king e8. Okay, still everything seems to be under control. But now rook a2 <coughs> introduces a slight element of doubt in black's mind. This is a good move by white. And um, it's the move which actually saves him. Because Black's got to spend a little bit of time reactivating his rook on h4. And the time he spends, Black, uh, White uses to exchange a pair of pawns and then to activate his own rook. And now, <coughs> now of course, it's not at all easy for Black. So you can see rook and pawn endings are, are, are actually quite difficult sometimes. The, 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 the most important thing you've got to remember is to keep active. Pawns are less important than activity. And I think Black got a little bit greedy there, going in and taking off the h pawn. And, um, well, White over the last few moves actually played excellently, activating his rook. And now Black has problems, because the threat is rook g7, and I don't see how to stop it. All right, well, rook, uh, rook h6 was played. Rook g7, yes, please. g4, with every pawn that comes off the board, White's difficulties are decreased. Now, of course, the position is a clear draw. White goes, uh, black goes e5. Rook e7 check, king d8. And uh, probably a very frustrated black player offered a draw, which was accepted by white. Okay, we're not interested in the overall result in that game. Probably the only thing we don't be interested in. But it was a hard struggle all the way through. All the same, I think. Okay, well, just let's summarise the position after bishop e2. Uh, going back, let's go back all the way to the open. This continuation can give white nothing. Uh, it doesn't interrupt the development scheme at all. Black can just continue with normal moves and get a very good.